Hey everybody, welcome to the next episode of the Thoughtful Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Matt. And I'm your host, Chris. And today's episode is going to be talking about the new human rights movement as uh, coined in Peter Joseph's work of the same name. And this is going to be a very interesting discussion today. I'm, I'm quite excited. But also as a bit of a preview as well for uh, the next week or so coming up, we'll also have the next episode coming out being about the stock market, modern monetary theory. Uh, fractional reserve lending, and the gambling aspects of Wall Street. So that'll be a pretty interesting episode to dive into and just how really antiquated our, our monetary system is. But to start off today's episode, I want to give a bit of context to this discussion. So as a lot of people know, whether it's through school or through the direct education that someone might have on the civil rights movement that occurred in the 60s, uh, is very much spearheaded by Martin Luther King and a group and just really a lot of the African-American pe- uh, community and those who have been disenfranchised for a while. And it was very much a galvanization of a group of those who were uh, very much left behind by the growing modern society. And it was a push in the, very much the right direction towards giving people access to to sort of the civil side of of how things work. And while a lot of people are familiar with how the civil rights movement shaked out and the pass of the Civil Rights Act, uh, a lot of people might not know that after the battle had been won and the Civil Rights Act was successfully passed in, I think it was like 1964 or something, uh, Martin Luther King shifted his focus towards the economic side of things. And as people who have tuned into this podcast know, that's very much a focus of the train of thought that we're trying to put forward is the socioeconomic system as a whole and why it needs to change. But with what Martin Luther King was focusing on, it while rudimentary at the time, whereas more focused on sort of a universal basic income type solution, that was where his focus was beginning to shift as the battle for the civil rights movement was successfully fought. And unfortunately, as the steam was getting rolling for that side of his activism work, unfortunately, again, his his life was cut short uh, as he got assassinated. But that is a good bit of context as to why he was able to recognize that that is another aspect of what is keeping people down, in a sense and their ability to participate in society as a whole is is very much the economic side of the equation. So that's going to be the focus of today's discussion is what the new human rights movement looks like and how it's it's got an economic focus and how that is going to be the evolution going forward uh, for, for the progression of this topic. So mentioning this as a, a bit of a, a prologue to how this is going to shake out, there are five key aspects that we want to mention in this discussion and that we'll be touching on throughout this discussion. Uh, so Chris, why don't you go ahead and lay out what those five aspects of the new human rights movement are? Yes, absolutely. So the, your economic rights, the five aspects of your economic rights. We got one, localization, two, access, three, automation, right? four, open source, and then the fifth and the final one is a digitized network feedback system. So five key things, all of them actually go very intertwined with one another. Very, They affect one another um, on the inner levels. But um, I'm going to start real quick here with the first one, localization. It's actually one that I'm a big believer in myself. Right now, with the whole globe, globalization, we have a pretty inefficient way of getting things from one place to another, getting materials or, or food is a big one as well. Um, I do believe uh, Matt actually told me a little factoid earlier about how the average American dinner plate travels 2,000 miles before it actually reaches in front of your mouth. And, you know, that's, that's just ridiculous. It's so inefficient and wasteful. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is because the, where those, those raw materials were sourced could have been 
you know, some random factory or some random field in a different country shipped at very costly, very costly shipped over to another country where then it might even not be at its final destination. It's still on its way to another country before you finally get it. Very inefficient and very wasteful. Yeah, so, and you could even look at it as you are producing a raw good that is used to produce something else in, in one part of the globe. It gets shipped halfway across the world to mm-hmm. some sweat sweatshop factory in, in Asia or some, some crap like that. And then it gets shipped another few thousand miles all the way back to the retail source where it gets distributed. It's just insanely inefficient with how these these resources are being transported, utilized, manufactured, and just all of those aspects. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, food, uh, food is a very good item to try and picture what we're talking about here. The cold storage as well, things that has have to be transported and kept cold at the same time are so expensive to transport. And if it loses power, it gets delayed in any type of way, boom, immediately wasted. And it's usually foods, the foods and, and whatnot, that are even medicines that have to be in cold storage that are just going to waste here. So with localization, what we're talking about is, of course, you know, within the word, your local community, your city, or, or you know, even maybe just your state, um, taking the reins to be more uh, productive in their own manufacturing or their own sourcing of what local goods they have around them instead of just buying it from a far off place where it would have to be shipped. So, of course, you don't have everything. Um, you know, one city can't produce everything that it needs to run, but that is where um, networking and communication can come. Because if I can create, for example, if I can create a, a product here that needs a product that Matt has in the city where he lives, he's much closer to me than trying to buy my source from somewhere in China or just some random place like that. But we don't have very much localization as a as a city right now as a country even in the system we're a very import heavy type of country the usa at this moment and we could negate a lot of this waste and a lot of this inefficiency if we were to start to look at our own community and our own our own resources of our land and actually build them up and and try and provide our own raw materials to be manufactured into further goods that can, you know, again, be locally transported at a much cheaper cost with much less and uh, uh, with much more efficiency, actually. This in, in all would just, you know, make everything smoother, of course. It'd make it to where you as an individual have more access to your goods and your needs without, you know, worrying about delays. There's a huge supply chain issue right now with across the entire world. And, you know, it's kind of got everyone in a bit of a mix because we don't produce our own goods to to be able to use on our own. We're relying on a uh, you know, factory 5,000 miles away to produce it and ship it here. So um, I kind of threw out the, the word access there as, as, as I was talking about it. But that's actually the second topic as well of these five key economic rights. Well, and, um, and I do also just want to touch on the localization point as well you are Mm -hmm. very much correct in saying that it's about increasing efficiency reducing waste and the more that a local area can produce enough not only life-sustaining goods but those that are more tertiary in their use there is always going to be more redundancy and it allows again a a local community to be more self-sufficient and it, it just adds a, a better layer in a way to how the economy functions. And if you're not able right. to do it yourself, then yes, that, that's when you reach out for certain things. We had talked about an example of, you know, it's, it might be hard for some place in Canada to, to grow avocados easily, to use a food example, or to produce some resource for, for a factory. You know, not every place is going to have access to rare earth minerals or something, but when it comes to basic goods that is is not only produced and mitigated through the use of technology, uh, which can allow local areas to to more efficiently 
be reliant on themselves. And, and that's another aspect is technology is what makes this more possible these days. Uh, that's that's oh, yeah. really the element there is reducing waste, increasing efficiency, using technology to to really make your local community more self-sufficient. Yeah, no, no, uh, a really clear way of putting it, actually. And so this all greatly also goes hand in hand with having more access in your community. Um, that's the, uh, another key element to this economic movement. And the greater the access that you could have in your community, the more options you have as an individual to be able to go out and um, using hopefully more localization, gain access to more goods and to more information and to more community events even that are going on. The better your entire economic community as a whole will be able to function. So when, let's say, if we were to have a, a big increase or, or more localization, more things being produced locally, then you as a, even just a consumer, but more so as an individual, you would have better access to those goods. You know, the supply chain issue wouldn't be an issue at all. The um, information for one thing, there's, uh, of course, the technology we have these days, you know, we have internet practically around every inch of the globe that we're not taking advantage of as, as much as we need to because we could use these technologies to increase how much the individual can access anything local in their community. And again, that's just going to make your experience and your, your contribution to the community even easier and smoother if you can just, you can actually, you know, be able to go out and access like uh, the, 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 the plant, the plant or the the farm that's growing the meal locally that you're going to be eating or the the textbooks and the the raw information that you need to gain a skill for your community um we want to increase the level of access you have as an individual for all of this and it's not only access from like a pure resource perspective but it's also access in terms of as as chris mentioned your ability to participate in the economy as a whole. While we all can see that the the current paradigm is very much about private property, I have my stuff, you have your stuff, let's keep each other separate. While that's something that is, is very much going to stay to a certain degree as, as everybody needs their own domiciles and places of, of residence and, and their own personal spaces, it's it's access in a in a broader context. It's access to resources as opposed to having the false scarcity notion that we have these days, where you are locked behind your economic ability to get enough money to to get these resources. Whereas in a pure access based system, you are able to go out and get what you need relative to the the system as a whole and what it's producing and. It's not, again, as I said, it's not only aspect of, of the resource ability of, of people to go out and, and do these sort of functions, but it's also access to being able to participate in, in how the wider economy functions. And if you have access to, again, as Chris said, go learn certain skills or to do something that you're passionate about and, and pursue what, what you as an individual really have an interest in and you have the ability to to pursue those those thoughts and those dreams for lack of a better word you are not pigeonholed into something that you're not passionate about and you have uh, again to to use the word you have access to what you greatly desire as opposed to what the current paradigm forces you into just for for pure survival means so yep, yep. giving people the ability to access not only what they need to live, but to access what they need to live to their fullest is really the big point here. Right. Well, what a great way to segue into automation, another huge part of the economic rights movement. Yeah, man, automation, it's, it's really the backbone of what frees up a lot of the aspects of, of what we had just mentioned. Because if, if a lot of the, the menial jobs and, and the ways that people function in the economy 
are able to be automated, it, it again, it frees up the human experience. It allows people to uh, pursue what they, they greatly desire and what they are truly passionate about. And that, that's, that's been the trend. You know, we as a species have evolved with our technology to free up our daily lives. You know, no longer are we out in the fields with a sickle harvesting wheat like that. We have big machines that are able to go out and do it at a greater rate. And as the future goes in a more automated sense, and you can look at the trends and and factory type industries you can look at it in terms of customer service where those have a lot of menial type jobs as well and it it is the metric to how you can think of it like the muscle in a way of how this this system functions it allows the production of the goods that people would get access to in their local economy and instead yeah. of people sitting behind in a in a machine labor job where they're punching out 500 holes on on a metal sheet of you know a metal sheet every day as their job, you're able to automate these things. Where you know again you can look at the automotive industry, technology industry, agricultural industry. It it is utilizing our technical advancement and our capacity to facilitate us as a species shifting more towards what we greatly want to pursue our passions with and it very much as i mentioned it frees up the human experience and allows us to pursue advancement at a better rate and it's just it's it's very much the trend as well uh even in the current socioeconomic paradigm of free market capitalism businesses are automating it's it's a trend and mm -hmm. and it's a thing that we can easily quantify as well but in, in the current mindset, somebody might look at it as, you know, oh, there's the downside of automation that it's, it's going to be taking jobs. And, and how am they I going to, yeah, they took my job, you know, how, how, how does that work, man? Well, you like, look at what the automation is doing. It's taking away things that might be dangerous. As I said, things that are menial as well, that... Right a regular human who might have different passions and interests is being forced into from a labor perspective to be able to get money to participate in the system. And that is the real technical benefit. It, it allows the, the freeing up of, of time. And that oh, allows the, the human capital, the human resource to be shifted towards things that greatly benefit the society and and your local community as well uh as compared to as we all know sitting behind a cashier checking out people's groceries all day you know we see the trend with self checkout systems and it's it's as i said it's just the trend and it's right. it's a good trend because it it very much increases the level of public health metrics as well People will become happier since time is freed up to, as I said, pursue things that, that they're passionate about. So uh, automation is, is the vehicle that allows all of this to occur. Right. And then and before we move on, I'd just like to point out how automation will be a huge component when it comes to more localization. You know, you might wonder, you could just go and say all, all day long, oh, let's just have more more local factories for for more jobs or something in town to produce more locally um well actually if we had the automation to do these jobs instead then not only would our localization uh just be able to increase but it'll be done without taking the time of our, our more and more people it'll be done just way more efficiently as you mean you had talked about yes. before how these mm -hmm. automations can run 24 hours a day and instead of, you know, an eight hour shift, I would much rather have a, 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 a manufacturing plant constantly cranking out freaking, oh, I don't know, shoes, um, instead of knowing that uh, maybe, maybe 80 to 100 people are required to work in that plant instead. So automation is going to be a big key component for local, for greater localization as well. Yeah. And that, that's a very good point is it's another element of increasing efficiency, reducing waste, and mm -hmm. really allowing the local community to produce more than they would 
as as you know if you're importing stuff that is made in in factories across the world and it's it also feeds into the zero marginal cost uh perspective as well whether it's marginal or zero as as time goes on it it's the way that you are able to reduce the amount of inputs into the system and just overall increase the the output that you have and as the trends go with technology advancing it's it's only going to get better you know a, a good point yeah. is the concept of ephemeralization which was coined by R. Buckminster Fuller. It's the way that, you know, as technology advances and things progress, you can do more and more with less and less. Your average supercomputer from the 60s took up thousands of, of kilowatts of power and would dim the lights in the local neighborhood, whereas nowadays you have a cell phone that has 10,000 times the computing power and mm -hmm. you charge it for a few hours at, at, on your wall. So yeah. that that also fits into what the trend of automation looks like as the machinery gets more advanced and is able to do more. It's only going to make the system more efficient and be able to meet uh, more needs. Right, right, right. So, so yeah, and that actually feeds quite nicely into the fourth point here, which is talking about open source. Uh, or or just open source uh, technology. And you, you could even look at it not only from a pure technological standpoint, but I'll, I'll get into that as, as I elaborate here a bit. So okay. open source is the, the best example for those who don't know what it is. Um, instead of having, you know, let's say you have a piece of software technology. Instead of 20 people at some software development firm sitting behind a desk working on it for you know x amount of hours to produce this good you have input small amounts of input from thousands of different people in either your local community or globally that contribute to the project as a whole so instead mm -hmm. of it being not only proprietary and locked behind some sort of uh not necessarily paywall but some sort of you know we're the ones who created this we're the ones that are going to update it this is how it's it's going to go you have contribution yeah not secrecy could could be a way to describe it as well you have inputs from a lot of different sources and not only does that make turnover time faster so technology gets developed at a much better rate you have different perspectives coming in from many different people to contribute to whatever the whatever the good is that is being worked on but you also increase the level of redundancy when it comes to developing these systems so when you have all of these different minds and many different pieces of, of perspective being put into this puzzle you create something that is is better than how we've done it before and this is borne out by technologies like the Android phone platform that is a totally open sourced platform that as the APKs get developed over time, it comes from the, con the contribution of thousands of different developers across the globe. You could also look at the, the Linux server software system and the operating system as well. It's another example of an open source piece of technology that has very much been a go-to when it comes to computer and server management. So it's, it's, it's very much a way to shift from a small group of people being locked into one project to almost democratizing the way that people participate. And again, you, you make turnover time quicker. There are more mm -hmm. perspectives that you can put into a project and it it just makes it makes the whole process better and you could look at it not only from a pure technology standpoint but also in terms of a a systems perspective as we talked about in the first episode when mentioning like system science and basic socioeconomic framework it's a way that you can also make the economy and the way that the overall local system functions uh, more efficient and more participatory as well. So you could look at it, uh, this almost goes in tandem with the access point where 
people are able mm -hmm. to contribute to the way food systems are developed or water systems or electricity or art projects or whatever it might be, you create a, a better whole and, and a way that people can, can dedicate their time towards doing something greater than, and not saying that you as an individual can't make your own pursuits, that's something that the automation is also supposed to free up, but it allows you to pursue larger projects on a grander scale with having the access to do so. And if things are done in secret, behind a proprietary mindset, you, you never get as much creativity, as much development, and uh, just it, it overall muddies the, the creative process is, is a good way to explain it. Right, right. It is a, a access and being open source are very similar. Oh, definitely. And again, as I said, it's a way to, you could look at it as sort of a democratization of how things function and creating a system that is open sourced from the get-go is a way that you can just make it yeah, that's the tr that's another trend i guess is is the way to say it another example could be like the thousands of different wikis that exist on the internet for anything from creative universes to something like wikipedia there's there's all kinds of of different benefits that these platforms uh, give out so open yeah. source yeah. is an element that's very important and it allows kind of a glue for all this to stick together. And uh, it's just, it's, it's very much a benefit to how the system functions. Yeah. So this also, uh, as we said, this is kind of the sequence you're going in. The last one is going to be talking about digitized network feedback. And I want to go back again to our first episode that we did on system science and socioeconomics as a bit of an example. But digitized network feedback, the, the easiest way to explain it is it's a way to, to manage the system. You need to figure out how many resources you have coming in, how they're being used, how much is being accessed, how much is left over, what is your, your waste quantifiers looking like, you know, how many people are looking to do X activity? You need different digital sensors and ways to, to get feedback into the system to, to have it function. And with the digital revolution that we've gone through, we can do this faster at a much lower cost than we've been able to do before. And it's a way that we can really tie everything together. You can think of it like the skeleton to the system as well. And... The way that, uh, that the example I want to mention with, with Stafford Beer and what he did with Chile, uh, they did this back in the 70s with like high and low frequency radios and telex machines. And they would feed this, this economic data and, and, and feedback through, you know, the factory would call in, oh, we've produced 300 chairs today. And then that information would get relayed to to Santiago, where various economic ministers would figure out what to do with that information, where the, the, the goods would go to distribution centers so that people in the local economy could access them. And while that's very much an antiquated example, it's, it's, uh, it's a way to, to show how that functions. It's, it's a way that we, we measure the feedbacks into the system, not only from the environment, but from what resources that we're working with to really help bring the picture together. And again, we do that through different sensors, creating an open source network that allows people to say, you could have like a platform or website where people can go on and say, oh, you know, we produced three tons of grain this month or some crap like that. And that's information that the community as a whole will have access to and can use that to direct how resources are being allocated and, and utilized. And it, it's just, uh, again, it's another type of, of element of the system to make it function properly. How, right. how, how would you kind of quantify it in your words, Chris? Well, so I, I, I was actually thinking about tying it back to Ashby's Law, you know, from... Um, Okay. From episode one, where, of course, you know, uh, in order to to have an efficient, viable system, 
the the regulators of the system need to be able to basically be in more control or have more um, power on the system. So it has they have to be greater than the system. And it almost it's a lot like the uh, the digitized network feedback is another tool that a regulator could use to constantly stay on top of the system itself. Because if it's if we're if we're lagging behind in, in information and we're not looking at things on a day to day, but instead quarterly or maybe even we're months and months behind, you, you're not going to be able to regulate the system, and that's how you start to fail basically. But um, with this digitized network feedback, is if you could have that going as a as a tool to help you regulate what you're doing, uh, you're just going to be even better at at controlling it at um, at making sure that there's no falters anywhere. Yeah, and I think that's that's a good way to put it as well. And not regulators, obviously, in the sense of like some individual, but regulators as a part of of the system and how it functions. And mm -hmm. we could even go back to the to the grain example. You know, if if let's arbitrary number, let's say we produce three tons of grain this month or whatever, we could say, okay, the community is going to use like two tons of grain. We're going to have this much left over. Let's contribute to another community who could have a shortage or we could have it as a type of surplus. And then going into the next uh, production cycle of that resource, we could say, OK, maybe we should tone it back a bit and not produce as much to help increase the, the level of efficiency and to reduce the amount of waste so that you have a way to see what resources are you working with? How are they quantified? How are they being used? And what is going to happen with, with the feedback that you're getting? So again, this is done through a variety of, of digital systems and sensors and different ways that you can input data into the system. And it's, it's very much a way to help kind of give eyes to how, to how things are functioning. And having it as a way that you can get data into your open source system is is another way to look at it. Yeah, the things we absolutely have the technology to do. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that again feeds back into the uh, firmalization point where as time goes on these sensors are gonna get more accurate and they can do more and the digital systems are gonna become easier to use, easier to develop, and can do more. And as that trend continues, it's just going to make the whole process that much easier. So uh, again, that's the five key aspects of what the new human rights movement looks like. You have localization, access, automation, open source, and digitized network feedback. And as we had mentioned before, all of these tie into each other to a certain degree. And as they begin to work together in sort of a beautiful storm, you see that it produces something that is, again, not only more efficient, creates less waste, but really frees up the human experience and is just, as, as Chris said with Ashby's Law, it's a more viable system. You see that it yeah. is a clear progression from what is, is the current paradigm. And it's a way to help give people a quantifiable way to change things as well. You know, everybody can say that you can look at what's going on these days and how much waste and, and how crappy and, and shitty things are. But if, if you give them real concrete ways to start looking at things differently, it helps progress the conversation and to really start to bring more of a, a, real change mindset with a lot of these discussions and having these points be some some uh, areas of discussion I think is a great way to to very much uh, increase the participation of people when talking about these ideas and to kind of further uh, progress right I like how you put um, change mindset in there like if you if, if we got a sec I would I was gonna actually mention a little note that I had while you I was listening to you talk about open source um, and in kind of similar vein too with automation but I'll start with open source um, we know we had mentioned before in episode one or two about the the free market capitalism system we live in right now being 
much more leaning towards competition as opposed to um, cooperation. Yes. Um, so this open source component of the economic rights, well, I would wonder, you know, someone might ask, why not already have a bunch of open source types of, of technologies going out on right now instead of just a few that we could use as examples? And someone might say, well, you know, that could lead to like maybe theft of information or or uh, some type of corrupt thing going on from mm-hmm. too many people. But I would like to, as you mentioned, you know, a change in mindset. I'd like to note how this competition that that breeds your your mindset of not wanting to open source and instead keeping it private. Well, that's the competition that the free market capitalism itself is incentivizing you. Because, you know, we, we're not incentivized to cooperate with other companies because we're trying to make money over those companies, then we're not going to have our stuff be open source. So instead, don't think about open source as a bad thing because, you know, all these, all these other externalities that could come in and, and possibly, you know, corrupt it. It is a good thing, even in free market capitalism. It's just you're so used to competition. And you're so used to you know, you know corruption, honestly, that it seems a little dangerous. It's it's not. You just have to have a change in mindset. Yeah, and that's that's very much an amazing point. As the not only is it a shift in mindset from the cooperation versus competition aspect of things, but because people are so much more connected with how things are functioning in their in their local community. There is much less, if none at all, of an incentive to to have that type of of uh, malignant interaction. And people, if if they know that what they're doing is directly impacting their family, themselves, the people next door, and their community as a whole, that very much breeds that mindset of why would I screw everybody over if I am ultimately going to be the one being screwed and that yeah. feeds into just a community mindset in general. If if your community is benefiting and those around you, ultimately, if you look at it from that selfish perspective, it feeds back to you as well. Because if your community has gone to shit, if you have mm-hmm. really brought down those around you, it ultimately will come back to you and how it affects oh, you and, and, and how you participate in the system. So I, I I think that's that's definitely a really good point there. But again, it is just a mindset shift from how capitalism very much breeds some of those aspects, as we said before, the cooperation versus competition, the fear versus trust, selflessness versus greed. And when the incentives start to be washed away and we focus on more of those positive aspects, that just further helps increase the progress that we can have when we're talking about these types of system changes. Yes, exactly. So, but uh, I think that's that's a pretty good point to to leave off on with this discussion. One thing we do want to mention as we are closing this out, uh, if anybody wants to dig deeper into this discussion, it's uh, all of this was based off of the work that Peter Joseph has done with his book called The New Human Rights Movement. And as we had mentioned before, this is very much the crux of the work, these five key aspects, but he dives into it into more detail. He gives more historical context, and it's it's very much a great read, and I, I recommend it to anybody who is interested in true systems change, and not just from a purely technical perspective, but also from progressing the sense of human rights and to freeing up the human experience and to see what the real battle in this future and sort of a metaphorical sense is going to look like. It's it's shifted from civil participation into the economic sphere. And that's very much the development that, that we're going to be focusing on. And as a greater point, the socioeconomic system, which involves uh, all of those different aspects as well. Yeah, yeah. So... But all right, everybody, that is going to end today's discussion on the new humans rights movement, the new human rights movement. Um, 
please tune in next week. As I said, we'll be doing one on, on money, modern monetary theory, stocks, uh, Wall Street gambling, all that kind of stuff, fractional reserve banking, uh, just to really point out how, honestly, it's it's pretty stupid the way money works these days. And it's, it's very much, uh, you can look at it from a technology perspective. It's very much an antiquated technology, but uh, all right, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in, and we will catch you sometime soon for the next episode.